excited to preach through 2 Timothy with you all. As many of you know, we sometimes preach topical sermons, but my preference and my heart is always to teach you how to read the Bible on your own by helping lead you through books of the Bible and saying, hey, this is how you should handle God's holy word for when hopefully you are reading the Bible day in and day out in your homes. And 2 Timothy struck me as a, as a book that would be good for our church because it's probably Paul's most relational letter written to his closest disciple, this young man, who's probably a grown man at this point, named Timothy. Paul is writing at the very end of his ministry. Later in 2 Timothy, we're going to see all over the place, he, he seems to be saying that his race is coming to an end. Death appears to be waiting for him. He might either, possibly, he is still under house arrest in Rome, as we saw in Acts chapter, what was that, 28? Yeah, Acts 28. So maybe he's ill and he's at home uh, under house arrest, but more likely his court trials aren't going well and the death penalty awaits him. Either way, he's writing a letter to this young man who he discipled, who he loves, who he knows, to one, strengthen him in his ministry, but also to say, hey, Timothy, if I'm gonna die, I want you here with me. Would you come? Would you bring my cloak? Would you meet me in Rome? And so we see Paul here communicating his most cherished theology, the theology of grace that brought him to death, from death into life, from persecuting the church to serving the church, to his most cherished disciple, Timothy. And being a pastor of this church and being gone for three months, it struck me as an important book that we could go through together as my affection for you only grew in my time away. So if you would, please turn with me to 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 and 2. If you don't know how the Bible's broken up, this is all the way at the, mostly at the end of the Bible, flip mostly to the back. It's what's called a Pauline epistle or a pastoral epistle. That just means a letter that was written to a specific church. Now, 1 and 2 Timothy are significant because they're written to a specific person, his most beloved disciple, the one that he calls a son, and to the church of Ephesus, the church that Timothy leads as an elder in the church or a presbyter or a priest. Now, some of you might be wondering, okay, is Tim just skipping 1 Timothy? Shouldn't, like, is that like skipping to the end of the book? Or is that like, you know, none of us like the new Star Wars movies, right? So is it, I'm just going to skip to the real ones from the 80s, right? You should be allowed to do that in Star Wars, but you shouldn't do that with the Bible. No, it's, it's, it's not, that's not how the Bible's broken up. These are very specific letters written in distinct settings or uh, distinct moments in the history of the church covering distinct topics. So I thought it fitting to cover 2 Timothy for the season of our church, but that doesn't mean that we're skipping 1 Timothy or that we won't ever cover it one day. So I just want to clear that up. It would be like saying you can't preach Luke unless you preach Mark. Okay, no, we can preach 2 Timothy here together. Now, what I'd like to do today is to look at the greeting of 2 Timothy, because Paul often has a great deal of theology going on in his greetings. And the greeting of 2 Timothy is very similar to the greeting of 1 Timothy. So I want to look at three things. First, Paul's ministry to the church and how he understands his role to this church. Second, I want to look at the familial relationship of Paul and Timothy. He calls him a son. And third, I want to look at this word mercy that he brings in. Paul often talks about grace and peace when he begins a letter. But in this letter and in 1 Timothy, he brings in the word mercy. So why might Paul be doing that? Why might mercy be on his mind, particularly towards the end of his life? So if you would, please turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. First, let's look at this, this word, this apostolic ministry of Paul, by the will of God. So he has an apostolic ministry by the will of God. Now, 
In the ancient world, there was no return address. So you had to begin your letter by stating your authority. Upon what grounds does Paul have any right to write this letter? You know, if you get a letter in the mail and, it's, and it clearly is junk mail, what do you do? You throw it in the trash, right? But if it has a very clear uh, government emblem on it, maybe from the IRS, you figure, you're one, your heart sinks, right? Oh no, what bad news is this bringing me? And you open it up rather quickly, right? Because the IRS has a right to demand that you read their letters immediately, whereas spam mail doesn't. Paul is here saying, hey, you need to read the letter I write because I'm an apostle. Now, this word apostle is notoriously difficult to untangle. And there are many different understandings of how we understand the apostolic ministry of the early church. Now, the two offices of the church are rather clear, right? A presbyter, or what some call elder, or what some call priest, or what some call pastor. I wish we all just had one word for that. That's an ordained office that Timothy carries. That's someone who is responsible for word and sacrament and church discipline and church care. Deacons are servants of the church. Um, But what are apostles? Some believe apostles are the early form of bishops. Uh, They have a responsibility to be pastors of pastors, presbyters of presbyters, and they go around like Paul, leading people like Timothy. That's a plausible reading. I'm not sure I buy it, but that's a plausible reading. Um, I, I think it's a plausible reading. Some people would say it's simply someone that starts new churches. An apostolic ministry is someone who pioneers the church. That's a plausible reading as well, because what do we see the apostles doing? They start churches all over the place. But I think probably the clearest reading, at least the safest reading that I can come to, and the church is often taught, primarily taught, is that it's just a member of the 12, someone that Jesus Christ specifically called to witness his ministry and to proclaim his ministry to the world. But some complications occur when that is understood as an apostle, because one, uh, you know, James is considered an apostle, we see that later, but also the apostle Paul. Paul if you recall, was not for Jesus. Paul was in the process of hunting down the apostles after Christ Jesus rose and reigned at the right hand of God. Paul was converted through the resurrected ministry of Christ. So how is Paul made an apostle? We see it in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 through 11. This is Paul's great testimony about his life in his ministry. He says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James... Then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has, was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. What is Paul saying here? He is counted among the apostles, not by any worth within himself, not because he read his way into realizing Jesus was the Messiah, not because he reasoned his way there, not because of any particular righteousness within himself. Rather, he calls himself the least amongst the apostles. He is one that is even unworthy to be called an apostle because he was seeking to persecute the apostles. He is an untimely born apostle. And he comes with all of the frailty and weakness of an irregular birth. His experience of the light of Christ did not come as a gentle moment of Jesus saying, come follow me, but came in a blinding light, which knocked him to the ground in order to give him sight. So what is Paul saying here when he says that he is an apostle by the will 
of God according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Is he saying, I am called to be an apostle because of God's will. Ergo, submit to everything I say, right? You maybe have heard that from pastors before. I have a call from God, therefore you have to listen to everything I say. You know, no, you don't. It needs to be judged by the communion of saints and the scripture itself. Is he saying that? No. What he is communicating is that it is only by the will of God that a man like him could ever be called a follower of God, let alone an apostle. He was one who sought to destroy the church, not build it up. He was one who sought to tear down the work of Christ, not to build upon the work of Christ. And yet by God's grace, by God's will, he took a man in sin and in death and he brought him to life. And this is the ministry that Paul carried with him all of his days, a ministry of grace, a ministry that proclaimed that God does not call the worthy, that he does not call the righteous, but he calls sinners into life. This is why in 1 Timothy 1, 15, he says this, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. What is Paul's apostolic authority built upon? The grace of God that called a man who was in death and brought him into life. And this was the only word that Paul proclaimed to the church of Ephesus or the church of Rome or the church of Philippi. And it is still the word that he proclaims today in glory that Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Some of you think that your past disqualifies you from proclaiming the word of God to a lost and a broken world. And what I want to tell you, it is precisely your past that qualifies you to proclaim a word of hope to a lost and a broken world. Our God loves to work through sinners. Our God loves to work through those that have been humbled by his grace and live all of their days clinging to him and to him alone. I hope you know that that's the only way I can be a priest in this church. It's the only way I can stand before you. It's the only way you can stand before one another, purely by the grace of God. First, we see Paul's self-understanding. He is one that is called by grace. Now let's look at his relationship with Timothy. He's got this deep bond with this man. He says this in verse two, to Timothy, my beloved child. Now, I thought it would be appropriate to have a quick and brief aside because many of you have heard that you cannot call anyone father or teacher or rabbi because you've read Matthew 23, verse 9. I thought it would be important that we actually read that passage today. Is Paul breaking that rule? Is Paul in the power of the Spirit contradicting the Spirit here? Matthew 23, 9 says this, and call, Jesus says this, and call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is, who is in heaven. So when Paul refers to Timothy as being like his child, Paul's a male, so he's referring to himself as a father to Timothy, is he breaking that commandment? Well, if you look at Matthew 23 in its broad context, what do we see? Jesus is critiquing the scribes and the Pharisees who are engaging in what is historically called this relationship of the pater familias, which is the, the fatherly figurehead of a family. And that person cannot be questioned. That person's word is law. That person uh, stands basically in, in the stead of God to his family. And what was occurring in during Second Temple Judaism, which is the time where Jesus was engaging his ministry, is that the Pharisees were rather comfortable standing in the place of God to God's people, putting a yoke around God's people's neck, teaching things that were well beyond what the scriptures actually communicated and demanding absolute adherence from their disciples. This is why he says, don't call them rabbis, do not call them fathers, do not even call them instructor. Why? Because that word of instruction or rabbinic dialogue or fatherhood, that was seen as 
absolutely authoritatively binding. Some of you grew up in radical fundamentalism, and maybe that's how you found the Reformed Church, and said, I need a tradition that's actually beyond a person, right? Some of you have experienced what this is like. It's stifling, it's destructive, it's incredibly painful for people that are under it. That's why we have to understand Jesus isn't saying dads can't be called dads. Often I've heard Protestants say, you know, Catholics just don't read Matthew 23. But I'm like, well, do you let your kid call you dad? Because Jesus, if you take that as being binding, he can't even call you dad. Okay? So this clearly is not what is being taught. And I think it's actually an unfair uh, communication with Roman Catholics to just say, well, they don't buy the scriptures. Now, to that point, many of you like to call me Father Tim. Or you might be, were even raised in a tradition that said, well, those Anglicans don't buy the scriptures either. So here's what I want to tell you. You're allowed to call me Father Tim. Jesus does not forbid it in Matthew 23. Paul is not doing something contrary to the teachings of Holy Scripture and Christ Jesus. However, I would communicate to you, if, if that serves you and you say, ah, oh, I love to call Pastor Tim, Father Tim, because I love my dad and I love that relationship and I want my children to see him as a father in the faith that serves them and, and is serving them his whole life, that then you can. However, I'd also communicate my preference is Pastor Tim. My preference is Pastor Tim as, as kindness to visitors who maybe come from a tradition that quickly read Matthew 23 and immediately assume we don't believe the Bible, okay? So you are allowed to call me Father Tim, but I prefer Pastor Tim. Aside over, now let's get back to what this passage is actually communicating to us. Timothy loved, or Paul loves Timothy. Paul has known Timothy his whole life. Paul has known Timothy when he was a young, scrappy pastor. In 1 Timothy 4, he says, hey, don't let anybody judge you because your age. That was my life verse when I planted this church at 29 years old. You know, don't let anybody judge you for your age, Timothy. Right? He has been loyal to this young man his whole life. So loyal that he sees him as a very son. He has been patient with him. He has been his biggest cheerleader. He has seen him grow to the point that, you know, there's a great deal of time that's elapsed between these two letters. So he doesn't even need to address him as being particularly young anymore. He's just simply a leader now. So what does that communicate to us about how we ought to love one another in the church? You all know that my preferred word for you all is family. I believe that the image of family for the church is the most significant image for our time and in our place. I once had a theologian say, I'm so sick of people in the church talking about the family. It's just marketing. I said, that's the only image you can talk about about the church. What are you talking about? Do we just live like a family? The answer to that is often no, or at least we live like a dysfunctional family. So what does Paul show us about the relationship between a father and a son? What we see here is <laughs> delight and patient devotion. If we want a familial bond in the church, elders, and I don't mean presbyters, I mean people that are above a certain age, I won't name the age. Elders, you are required to have delight and patient devotion with the young. If you do not, there will not be a familial dynamic here. It has to start with you. Let me explain. I don't know who Timothy was, but my name's Timothy and I was a young pastor. And my only assumption is that Timothy did a lot of things to make Paul mad over the years. I cannot believe a scenario in which Timothy did not chafe against Paul lots of times. I can't believe it. We often think these are just these stories that fall out of heaven. Everybody's perfect, except for those Corinthians are pretty bad. And then the bad guys in the text. But other than that, everybody's just great. No, Timothy was probably pretty annoying pretty consistently, right? That's what young leaders do. That's what young people do. We're confused. We struggle with ideas. We jump the gun on things. We get out over our skis. And so what is required of elders in the church? 
to delight in the young so much over such a long period of time that you patiently are devoted to them so that they can grow in maturity and stature. I asked Kyle if I could share this. I can, don't dig into it. I can't remember the details, but I was real irritated with them early on in the church. I can't remember what it was. He was right out of moody. So he had all the answers at 22. And I was only 29 at the time, but I don't recall what it was, but I was quite irritated. And I remember my dear friend, Wes Trevor, who is kind of Kyle's other significant mentor in his life. He and I were talking and he just kept saying, Tim, we just gotta be patient. He's doing such a great job at X, Y, and Z. We just got to be patient. And I thought to myself recently, when I was on sabbatical, had I let my irritation at that time boil over, we wouldn't have the best young priest in the diocese. And we do. I know the other young priests in the diocese. They don't hold a candlestick to Kyle Stanton. They don't. I'm not, I, if we don't delight in the young, makes us patiently devoted to them so that we aren't jumping the gun with an irritation and smashing down an issue, but patiently waiting. We won't get to see them grow into maturity and thriving. And I pray that you all know and experienced that thriving as he led our church all summer. Delight in the youth, commit to the youth, be patient with the youth. If not, we won't have a family dynamic in the church. Now, second, I wanna to talk to the parents here for a moment, and I am running low on time. Parents, I'm gonna go quick on this one. You already know what I'm gonna say. If you want your children to experience the joy of the communion of saints in the family of the church, you cannot expect them to build bonds in the church if you bring them occasionally. It won't happen. It won't. When I go home to my little town of Richmond, Indiana, and I visit my little Presbyterian church, what do I experience? People coming up to me and giving me huge hugs. How are you doing? How are the kids? Why? Because they've known me my whole life. They've known me longer than you've known me. 19 years in that little church where they poured into me, into my family. But it's because I was there. We are in a time where we have more opportunities than ever before. And therefore, it will require a greater commitment than ever before to prioritize the communion of saints. There is one person to this day that's graduated from our, you know, church and, and gone on to life, and I still meet with him. And he's struggling in life right now. And I often tell him, listen, I've known you since you were a child, and you're a man now. And you are never going to be at peace until you come back to the Lord. And I don't want you to be at peace until you come back to the Lord. This isn't who you are. This isn't the man I know. You have wandered far from the people of God and you are haunted by the Holy Spirit. He has ceased to be a comforter to you. He is a haunting to you because he is pulling you back home. And we are here waiting for you when that moment happens. And I am utterly confident it will. And you know why he keeps meeting with me? It's because I've known him since he was a boy. And I want that for each of your children. But like no time in church history, there are things that are good things that are going to rival your energy and your time with the people of God. And my prayer for you is that you would put your flag on the ground and say, as a family, we will limit ourselves in order to go deeper with God's people because that's what it's going to require in today's church. But if you want your children to go, grow up where they are known and loved like children to parents, that's what the Lord's calling you to. So, what does Paul communicate? First, his apostolic authority. Second, this familial bond of love in the church. And then finally, I want to look at mercy. Look back with me. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord. 
Now, Paul, like I've communicated, he often begins with grace and peace, right? This is the, this is the image of his ministry. God's grace brings us into peace with God. It is not by our works. It is not by our adherence to the law. It is only by his direct will to bring us out of death and into life. But here he also talks about mercy. Mercy that our God saw us in our suffering and chose to not leave us there. Mercy, this posture of God towards us out of which grace flows. Mercy, this great image of the cross that our merciful God did not leave us in suffering, but took our suffering upon himself. And it's not in the text, but I can't help but wonder because I've experienced this with people who have gone through suffering, that the mercy of God towards the end of life becomes so significant because Paul is about to die. He knows he's about to die. We're gonna see later in 2 Timothy, his friends have abandoned him. He's alone. So much so that he has to reach out to his friend at, town, at a town really far away to say, would you at least come and sit with me while I'm dying? If any time in his life that he would doubt the mercy of God, it would be right here. And yet what is upon his lips? God's mercy. It is my responsibility as your pastor to prepare you for death. We've actually lost sight of that in the church. Maybe the church did a too good job of that for so long that we forgot to teach people how to live, but now all we talk about is how to live and we forget, frankly, because we don't wanna believe we're gonna die. And many of you know this church was planted in a state of my personal grief and other people in this church who faced unexpected, untimely, tragic deaths. And many of us haven't experienced that. We haven't experienced that moment in which a cataclysmic shift occurs. Everything's going fine, and then your whole world is turned upside down. Paul is out preaching the gospel, and now he's in prison, and his time is drawing to an end. The way maybe he thought his life was going to occur, conclude is not happening. And yet, he can still hold on to the mercy of God. When the friends of Job say, curse God and die, the Christian says, the cross of Jesus Christ has not changed despite my circumstances. The mercy of God is new every morning. If he has proclaimed he has formed me to the very point that his son died on my behalf, how could I doubt even now that God is merciful even to me? And the Christians that I have known who knew that deeply were the ones who were able to face the greatest suffering with both peace, but a clinging to God amidst it. Do you know the mercy of God so deeply that you don't doubt his mercy even in the midst of your greatest trial? This is what Paul communicated with his very life. This is his gospel of grace that he teaches us, that Jesus Christ has been for us, is for us and will be for us. And therefore God's mercy forever reigns in our lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are merciful to us. We thank you that by your cross, you have brought us into life. Lord, would we cling to your mercy and see your mercy all of our days. Lord, would you form a family here? a family of devotion and patience, of delight in one another as gifts that you gave us. Lord, would you form parental bonds of love in this place so that our children and our parents would know the great love of God to the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.